almost, I'll have to say almost, because there are other places. There are almost everybody, all of the government activity is in the CIA. There, it's in other places too, but primarily CIA. And these people know that they're the only ones doing that. It's a small group of them. It's interesting to know that if you are involved with a covert operation in Greece and you meet the people that are doing that and then you happen to be involved in one in Bolivia, same people. Mm. See, to them the world is all just one place, a big chessboard. They don't develop agents for Bolivia and then agents for Greece. They, they develop intelligence experts for Bolivia and intelligence experts for Greece because that's different. They develop... Um, mapping specialists for these areas because they're different and all that sort of thing. But when it comes to the covert operations, you'll find the same people. It used to, it used to amaze me. Of course, I got to know all of them. But um, if I were working with them up something up in Tehran and we were running some program there along the border of the Soviet Union, and then later on we're running a program up to Tibet out of Thailand with the same people. It's a relatively small group that really do covert operations. And the real leaders of that group are still anonymous and none of us will give their names uh, when you get to a man like Howard Hunt or a guy like uh, well you know the names are in the books all the time <laughs> they're there they're in the scenery but they aren't the movers they aren't the real ones the ones that really run these exercises are, are a group of professional characters it's just like a pro football team they are good they got the people that can carry the ball and they got the people that can block and so on and really, they have a good, greatest respect for them. Now, their leaders then, Bill Colby, Dick Helms, Alan Dulles, Des Fitzgerald, and so on, they become convinced that what they're doing is right and that they are able, that they have the ability. As Dulles said, he understood the craft of intelligence, and the craft is this covert business. So that's what I mean by writing it, that, that they are the dominant people in this business. Uh, in today's world, you can guess at the names of... When, when they bring people in briefly, like they did Admiral Rayburn and like they did George Bush, uh, you get a man that really is just keeping the seat warm there. It takes a long time to bring somebody up to this capability. The, the, the key ones, of course, the Dulles, but uh, Dick Helms. Dick Helms was a very effective uh, person in charge of covert operations. And then... You've pointed out that I put so much stress on their support side. You can't do any of this thing without the support. And what we always call DDS, uh, an organization headed by really, in my mind, one of the most important CIA men of all time, Colonel L.K. White, Red White, either red-headed person, Red White. <clears throat> well, uh, his organization of global support for CIA was the envy of anybody. Mm. If he wanted to run a Federal Express delivery system, he could have done it off the back of his hand. If he wanted to run the, uh, any other organization, he was great. Now, he had within his logistics system a, a deputy strictly for supply so that all of the things he needed were there, and he had his money man. So that his finance, the head of finance for the CIA was within <coughs> logistics, where it belonged. And then he had shops for instance, they call TSS. This is where they would take equipment that the Army might call rather far out and then go further themselves, you see, and develop all these spy gadgets, you know, that you see in the magazines and books, and even better. Um, I had the uh, enormous respect for the capability of the DDS area under L.K. White. A uh, little incident. Every CIA man traveling around the world always goes in a code name. And uh, uh, I forget some of them, but whenever Des Fitzgerald or Dick Helms or somebody would travel, they'd use a code name. When uh, White traveled, his code name was Blue. And the reason it was Blue, he was red, white, and blue. So <laughs> everybody, it broke the code when soon people figured that out. <laughs> but uh, he had under him in supply a, a Navy captain named Garrison who'd spent all his life in Navy supply, and he knew the business very well. His finance man matched our finance man in the, in the Defense Department, and they were very good. And <clears throat> really, it was DDS that made things work. When they needed boats, when they needed aircraft, they were there. Uh, DDS was very fundamental in all of the proprietary operations, meaning like Air America and the other units they had there. And that's quite a job because you're dealing there with civilian establishments right alongside military-type operations. 
So um, not enough has been said about the strength of the supporting groups in the CIA. Uh, do you think this sense of infallibility is still fully active today? I think Casey brought it back. Yeah. I don't know about it since Casey, but um, you could see it with Casey. I think Casey figured he could have done anything. You know, like, what was it, Atlas? Give him a big enough lever and he'll lift the world? Well, I think Casey felt that way. I think Casey was the nearest to Dulles of any they've had. And is that in part perhaps because he was from that original OSS core group under Donovan along with Dulles and Helm? <coughs> that could have something to do with it. It's the man. <coughs> mm -hmm. It's the type of person. See? Uh, indomitable. Yeah. Uh, you know, Alan Dulles, for all his... <laughs> He slipped around his offices in slippers because his feet, he was born with a club foot and his feet hurt him. But other than that, nothing ever shocked him. You know, he was just able to do things. This is kind of strange because otherwise he seemed like a little college professor, kind of meek and mild. But you, you charge him with doing something and he's going to do it. Yeah. Just, he's going to do it. Uh, mentioning from above this, uh, uh, some organization is given the authority to develop and control all foreign secret intelligence. Define for us the term secret intelligence. A lot of people have trouble with that. Uh, secret operations, of course, are clandestine activities. So we divide the two. And secret intelligence is when you have to use spies, uh, bribery, threats, murder, assassinations, in order to gain intelligence, See, in order to gain information, in order to protect information. The secret intelligence is a very special intelligence you aren't going to get any other way. And uh, it's just a division of the intelligence sector. And uh, it served its purpose for Dulles because he would say, look, if you're charging us with collecting intelligence, which of course the law didn't do, but he'd put it that way, then of course, in order to do it sometimes, we have to do these other things, which are covert operations. And he kept pushing from secret intelligence into, into covert operations. It was a springboard for him. And so he was always talking about secret intelligence as though that was the most important kind of intelligence. And then he was talking about covert operations so that he could get his secret intelligence. He, he, he kind of, it was a kind of a professional um, tactic of his to, to get, if, but in the vernacular, secret intelligence is what the Navy calls black intelligence. It's, uh, you have to use spies, you have to use bribery, uh, really inside intelligence. Uh, this essence of the ability of the secret team to exist at all in terms of this team or organization being able to first develop and control all foreign secret intelligence, and second, being able to then have full and unfettered access to the last authority to brief him on this controlled information a comment just on this uh, sort of uh, completely control of the entire system that enables the secret team to function. Uh, it's a good thing that you picked that up. It's more important than most people have any idea, if they even know about they have any idea about <clears throat> Every single day, intelligence is collected from all around the world by all of our intelligence capacity, whether it comes from the Treasury Department or the CIA or where. During the night, <clears throat> that is carefully boiled down to a, the essence of the intelligence of the day. <clears throat> partly because it completes the intelligence of yesterday, mm -hmm. and partly because something new comes in. And every once in a while, some more or less academic approach to open up a subject that needs to be described because it's very important. Um, the agency has been given the responsibility of doing that evaluation and uh, and then the, the collation of all this, and finally the presentation to the president. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a terrific job they do. And if you get used to seeing uh, uh, Walter Cronkite on TV every night, you know, you think you're seeing the essence of the world news. Well, you've seen nothing until you've seen this secret intelligence report that is uh, delivered every morning to the president. It, it, it's beyond even uh, anybody's belief. It is so good. It is so important. Um, <clears throat> the agency used to have a man named Kemp that was just astounding for this business and, and, and they, they're some of their best men do this work well it's done during the night so that by about quarter of eight if I'm right maybe quarter past anyway right around eight o'clock in the morning a pre-brief is given in the Pentagon way down in the basement the double basement of the Pentagon in a big audience room there for about 
50 cleared people. That doesn't mean they're all there that day, maybe 35 or 40, but there are only 50 people in the entire Pentagon, 35,000 people that are cleared to hear this pre-brief. And the pre-brief is a dry run. It's all the briefers of that day and all of their material, and it lasts maybe half an hour. And they, they, they uh, make this briefing for the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff and the others. They all hear this same brief that day. And then they leap into their cars, go to the White House, and brief the president. That's why it's called a pre-brief. And the president hears this entire briefing. Well, as you can see, that's a very formative thing. For instance, the cabinet officers hear that briefing. The president hears it. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff hears it. During the day, that becomes their agenda mm -hmm. because... Let's just say something comes up during that day that involves Tehran. Immediately, they get all the Tehran experts on that subject. And what makes Washington run that day, whether people realize it or not, comes down from that pre-brief through the cabinet offices, through the top people. The cabinet picks up his phone as soon as he gets back to the office and he says, Hey, Charlie, get into this for me right away. I want everything you've got on that. And the next man, the next man, and then go back and they tell the Navy, do this, the Air Force, you do this. Because the pre-brief is saying what's going on this day all over the world. The newspapers don't even begin to get into the depth of this brief. And then you begin to realize that to a considerable extent, the briefing of the president every day and the pre-brief system provide the government with its agenda every day. And it's repeated the next day and it's repeated the next day, you see, so that the government moves along this line because, as we said before, when you use intelligence to run your activities, you are reacting. Right. You see? You are responding. You're on the defensive team on a football game. You're not on the offensive team. Mm -hmm. And it is the power of this pre-brief every day from the intelligence inputs that has been leading our government since the 40s and has created a system of government that is not what government is supposed to be. Right. Government should be leadership, you see. Just like I was talking about the Defense Department. We have a Defense Department. We don't have a War Department. It's so different. And that's why I say that the pre-brief, as given daily by the, by the intelligence community, and usually the DCI is right there, and the way yeah. Alan Dulles preempted this role, well, it actually began with Beetle Smith, right. that he preempted this role and then moved intelligence right into the White House and began to lead the government every single day. It has an enormous impact on what we would might call the political life of the United States, whether we realize it or not. Now, another thing, a working president has how many hours a day? Sixteen? If you take up one of his hours in the morning, you've taken up one-sixteenth of the time of the most important man in the world. And the intelligence community has created a situation by which they preempt that time, and he can't get loose from it. He's right. there. Right. Now, I don't know if Reagan went there every day, but you see the, the system's there every day. It doesn't matter who's there in person, really. I, I think that we have not considered the enormous importance of intelligence as the guide for our government and what our government does, <clears throat> and the fact that it runs on reaction, uh, and, and then the classic idea of government where the leader is up on a white horse, follow me. You know, he's leading and he's taking the government down the road. Mm. We talk about Mr. Bush's first hundred days of leadership. Well, I would imagine Mr. Bush hasn't missed one of these briefings. And I imagine that he's told his people, get on with that and do this. But you see, he's perfectly willing to accept because he was a DCI. He's the yeah. first DCI to ever be president. This is the way he sees government to run. Mm -hmm. And he's not ever going to lead. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact he doesn't have any money in his checking account. But yeah. this is a very important subject, mm -hmm. and this has been going on. Now, I went to these briefings for years, and I must tell you, they charge you up something awful. You come out of that thing after hearing everything that's going on, everything from satellite photos, you get the global weather conditions, you get everything that's going on during the day in that pre-brief. And uh, that's powerful stuff. And you're so busy during the day catching up with the things that this pre-brief tells you to do that all of a sudden it's tomorrow and you hear another pre-brief, see? And it, uh, it sets the stage for what goes on every day. If you haven't been involved in it at that point where you hear it and get the motivation, 
it's very hard to experience the impact that has on our government structure. I don't know what the government of England and France and Japan and, and uh, in Moscow are doing, but I, it wouldn't surprise me any that they're doing the same thing. Yeah. Did you attend these pre-briefs? Every day. I see. Every day. Mm. I was one of, I think, uh, 52 people, as I remember, that had the clearance to go. And uh, in my work, there were many times when I was one of the briefers, so that I was involved both ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And But your pre-brief, would you participate then in going over to the White House afterwards? If no. You would part no. Well, if you're the briefer, you do. But in my activities, the chairman would go, or I somebody see. like that. No, I don't think I ever went to the White House to brief. Um, in fact, by the time it gets to going to the White House, the group is cut down to the chairman, the DCI, and uh, maybe one or two others. By that time, you're down to Cronkite, you know, you're down to the last talk. That's the way it should be. It's, uh, it's, the thing just goes right down to an apex until you're talking to the president, see? And it's a very important briefing at that point. Very distilled. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd like to get into a more general subject here that is certainly central to discussing the rise and growth of Central Intelligence Agency and the secret team in the person of Alan Dulles. You write at one point that Alan Dulles was a counterpuncher and a missionary. He was a meddler. He thought that he had the right and the duty to bring his pet schemes into the minds and homes of others whether they were wanted or not. And I'd like you to just sort of in general discuss this mind of this man, Alan Dulles. Why do you think he felt he had the right to do all these things, and how do you think he justified this in his own mind? In order to um, get to the root of that, we have to recall that as a young man, uh, just graduated from Princeton, I believe, he went to Paris with the... Wilson Peace Conference group right after World War I. Uh, that is a pretty rich way for a young college graduate to uh, begin his work in international affairs. And I'm sure that that experience had much to do with the rest of his life. John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles were both senior directors of the biggest law firm in New York City at the time, Sullivan Cromwell. And their earlier work, of course, uh, made them very valuable to that international law firm and also brought them into the law firm's business throughout the world. And, and uh, their, the way they handled business on the international scale is very much shaped by their experience with Sullivan Cromwell. Mm -hmm. Now. The Sullivan Cromwell offices had the major U.S. legal contacts in Germany uh, during Hitler's period. Uh, we couldn't say they were essentially pro-Nazi, but they didn't close their office in Germany till well after the start of World War I. In fact, the, <laughs> the fact that they were still there when the war was going was became quite an embarrassment to the U.S. government to think that here we were, very anti-Hitler, anti-Axis, and, uh, and, and here we had this major law firm still operating there. Well, this law firm was, in a sense, dominated by these Dulles brothers who, whose idea of international affairs and international business was shaped by the law firm and by their activities. At the same time, John Foster Dulles, was either a founder of the World Council of Churches or one of its major guiding spirits. Uh, whenever he was not in the government or otherwise uh, assigned to some mission, he traveled all over the world as a principal spokesman for the World Council of Churches. Now, I make no brief for the Dulles view of the churches or even of their religion. It was rather, I think it was Episcopalian really, but I'm not sure. But this was the platform upon which the Dulles brothers spoke many, many times around the world. And in that sense, they turned their political views, their financial views, their diplomatic views uh, into a, an essentially missionary spirit. 
uh, they felt that wherever they went, they were bringing the word of the United States, the word of uh, uh, capitalism, what have you, around the world with them. Uh, this was very true in the period right after World War II. And um, may have had something to do with Truman's uh, uh, selection of Alan Dulles to study the intelligence agency, because if anyone was accustomed to international affairs, um, intelligence activities, covert activity, because of his OSS experience, Alan Dulles certainly was. And you put these all together, and regardless of the individual himself or his family relationships, which were strong, of course, because both his brother and sister were strong in the State Department, uh, you produce a person uh, called Alan Dulles who is a missionary, a diplomat, a financier, a lawyer, a really unusual individual for this period. Then you bring him into the government as the director of the Central Intelligence Organization of the country, and he calls upon all this background. Well, from my experience with him, uh, which for seven or eight years was rather considerable, he, you could feel this power in the man, that this was the way he worked. And he felt that he had a perfect right to preach capitalism as he saw it, or anti-communism, that's a big word, as he saw it, throughout the world. And it was people like Alan Dulles who really created the north-south confrontation, you know, or the, and east-west between communism, but the north-south with the, with the third world co countries. And either they should shape up with us or they were them. You know, there's no black in the middle, uh, no area in the middle where, where they were, they could ignore, there were no neutrals. Remember back in the old days when India tried very hard to be a neutral country and just wouldn't permit them. They had to be communists, they had to be uh, capitalists, either way. Well, this, this is the nature of Dulles. And when you worked with him, there, there was nothing, it was, either, it was either communism or the West. And, and uh, you can't describe <laughs> precisely these things, but it's in all the literature since World War II. It's in all of everything we were doing. And the agency was motivated along those lines, and especially as you saw Dulles move into these things that we were talking about, that through his ability to control the morning briefings, guiding the government along this reactive channel. Because when Dulles became the director of Central Intelligence, one of the first things he did in the agency was to abolish the DDA. We've talked about the DDS, the support and the logistics. We've talked about DDP, the clandestine operation. And of course, DDI was the Deputy Director of Intelligence, which is the ordinary intelligence business. But it had a DDA. DDA was administration, planning, management. He abolished that. He saw no use for it, you see. If he saw no use for management, planning, administration, that role in the agency, then you can see that what he was going to do is let his eyes and ears, his intelligence area, his covert area, find things to do and then do something. So he would react to things. And with that system that he applied, he brought it into the government so that the first thing you know, after several years, the government itself was becoming a government of reaction. And this is the one thing about having a CIA in a government like ours that makes it very dominant. It assumes the title without even trying because it's easy to correspond to reacting. You know, if you get punched, you punch back. That's easy. Uh, this is Mr. Dulles in a nutshell. And his shadow, having fallen over the government <clears throat> for so many years, has created a government which does react rather than become dynamic. And I think that this is very true in the last decade of our government, if nothing else. And I think it is this straitjacket that Kennedy mm -hmm. was trying to take to remove from the office of the presidency. Mm -hmm. And I think Kennedy was definitely making moves to rid the government from this reactive motivation. Of course, he fired Dulles. That's one first step. After he initially, as soon as he was elected, said he would take him on, but he didn't see yet what would happen until something like the Bay of Pigs came along yeah. to make him wary mm -hmm. of that. Well, and I think Kennedy, having a great confidence in his own ability to handle things, realized that he didn't have to fight the ten rounds of the championship bout all at once. He'd yeah. take them in order. 
and uh, and I think he lined up the campaign that he saw through his first four years as a chance to begin to really take over the government in his name and in what he wanted to do and in his latter four years make moves that would set history for many many years and of course as a lot of people have pointed out, he had Bobby in the wings and Teddy in the wings and then their children in the wings. They would have had Kennedys for years. At least that's a light way to look at it. But uh, Kennedy, I think, rebelled against this business of the reaction to things. He wanted to do some things. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, of course, put him in direct conflict with Alan Dulles and with the CIA and with that method of operation which really dated back to Walter Beetle Smith, too. Walter Beetle Smith is the one who started the pre-briefing, so we must not say that this was truly Dulles' origin. Um, and yeah. uh, this is important for historians. They should go back a little further and see that uh, Walter Beetle Smith, who was Eisenhower's closest confidant during World War II, who left that job to become ambassador to the Soviet Union, which is a quite an unusual assignment, and then came directly from being the ambassador in the Soviet Union to be the director of central intelligence. Should not be overlooked for the enormous role that he played. And then he stepped down from the, being the DCI to be the deputy to John Foster Dulles so that Alan Dulles could move into the slot in the DCI. I, I would not say that the Dulles brothers formed all this themselves. I would say that Walter Beetle Smith and his associates, including Eisenhower, had a lot to do with this even though it was Truman in 1950 who recalled Beetle Smith from Moscow to take over the CIA once there was this hue and cry in the country about how we'd been caught with our pants down in Korea yes. when the invasion yes. happened and we were that, being... That's true and I think that is a part of the greater problem of how the whole country, how the whole world rolled over from the alliances of World War II into the Cold War, World War III Cold War uh, of being anti-communist and Pavlovian anti-communist, you know, unreasonable anti-communism. Everything that we didn't like was anti-communist right away. Anything the Soviets did was against the, West, uh, against the West. And to create that direct opposition right out of the ashes of World War II and for what most people would say are very unreasonable reasons. No, nothing, nothing that they had done in Moscow that changed things. They had been our allies, and all of a sudden we we're opposed to them. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't. What I want to do is I don't want to leave with anyone the idea that this began solely with Dulles. Dulles perfected it, of course, and Dulles was the epitome of the person that fit that role. But he was not the first man. Beetle Smith was ahead of him. Mm -hmm. uh, we've discussed this briefly before, as far as your. Uh, office being transferred in either late 61 or early 62 from the the Office of Special Operations being transferred out of the Office of the Secretary of Defense and into the Office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I'd like your uh, ideas about the importance and significance of uh, sort of, I, it sounds as if in your writing, the concurrence of your office being transferred from OSD to the Joint Staff and how uh, to quote you directly, as a progression of this first move, the Joint Staff created an office called the Special Assistant for Counterinsurgency and Special Activities, or SACSA. Uh, that, that's a good way to put the question. Um, you see, as we discussed earlier, there had been in the Office of the Secretary of Defense ever since its establishment in 1947-48 uh, under Secretary Forrestal, an office of special operations and that office was there to take the directives from NSC that had to do with covert op operations and translate them into Defense Department work and a relationship with the CIA. Well, <clears throat> when Kennedy was elected, General Erskine had been working on a long study as to whether or not it would be wise to establish in the defense establishment a defense intelligence agency. It was quite apparent that although the CIA existed, it did not emphasize intelligence gathering adequately for the intelligence careerists and professionals in the military, and that they felt that a common defense establishment, DIA, would improve the military intelligence area, and in many ways also counterbalance CIA for their own benefits. 
and Joe Erskine is the one who wrote that study. When that study was concluded after Kennedy's inauguration, and I believe almost on the day of the Bay of Pigs exercise, if I remember the date, it seemed to me it came in almost on the identical day, um, it was approved by McNamara shortly after the, the general had given it to him. And General Erskine, who had then been in the Pentagon for, for more years than any other assistant to the secretary had ever been there, uh, retired uh, from his office. Uh, the question for McNamara then was, should he retain OSO as it had been and try to put another man in there, or should he divide it into other functions? Well, first of all, we had the overview of NSA. And in the technical world that had developed in those latter years with satellites and, and um, U-2s and SR-71s and all that, uh, much of that work had moved over into what we call ddr and &E, the, the defense, Deputy of Defense for Research and Engineering. So they moved that responsibility into ddr and &E. That took one big role from there. Another function in uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense that had moved up was ISA, International Security Agency. And much of their role was in connection with coordination with the State Department. So that responsibility, which had been in OSO, was moved to ISA. Then you get to this area of special operations, the support of the clandestine activities. And really, the work that was required took place in the services. But the three services had always been running each office independently. As I ran mine in the, in the Air Force, there was an Army counterpart and a Navy counterpart. And although we worked together frequently, it was more or less an ad hoc arrangement. We worked together, like for the Bay of Pigs, because we had to, it was necess necessity. But we didn't work together on policy matters or on budget matters, which is so important. So I was called in by um, uh, General Wheeler, who at that time was the director of the Joint Staff. This is a couple of years before he became the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and asked what I thought about bringing the special operations function into the JCS. And of course, immediately approved it because I saw the rest of the OSO office go. In fact, they had gone, and I was about the only thing left there uh, with, a, with a functional job but with no title. My boss had gone. General Lansdale was doing some special work for uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Mr. Gilpatrick, and was making trips to, uh, to not only Vietnam but to uh, Central America at that time, which for Lansdale was quite a new thing. And um, I told General Wheeler that I thought it would be a, a, a really a, a fine move to set up special operations under the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and to create an office that would unify the work of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, and of course including the Marine Corps. General Wheeler agreed with that and arranged a meeting with Mr. McNamara. I don't think the idea originated with General Wheeler. I think he had been asked to look into it. He agreed after we had talked together. And we went up to see Mr. McNamara. Mr. McNamara said, I will take care of getting the increase in the manning allotments for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which were limited to 400, sufficient to create this office. And you can go ahead and set up the office. So I, I moved from the physical area of the Secretary of Defense downstairs to the JCS area. Uh, an Army officer was assigned to my office along with uh, one or two staff and a Navy officer along with one or two staff. We had probably eight or ten people. And we, we established the Special Operations Branch of what became SACSA. Now the SACSA development was very interesting. There had nothing, nothing had existed in the Joint Staff like that before. This was a uh, special assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for counter-resurgency and special activities, two roles that are not traditionally uh, prime military roles. But during the Vietnam area, they became extremely important. Well, this creation <clears throat> brought with it another very important office that you hear little about, and that's the office that handles uh, deception. Uh, deception is a very important type of special operation. You create things that you want to have discovered that are wrong, so that uh, Moscow would think we had a gun that worked the way it worked and it didn't work, or a rocket that worked the way it did and it wouldn't work, and or that we sent people to some place to do a job that they'd think we were going to do and we were never going to do it. You see, this is important because 
when we set up the Bay of Pigs, on account of deception, if the Russians found out about that, or if Castro found out about it, he wouldn't know whether that was a de deception or whether we were going to do it. Deception is an extremely important function, rarely talked about. I don't know if anybody has ever written about it properly. And uh, at the same time that my office was moved to uh, the Joint Staff to unify Special Operations for the services, the men who had been working for years in deception unified their office in the same area. In fact, they were right next door to me. And and we used to, to work together quite a bit because it was important that we do that, to have deception <coughs> effective throughout the military services. This left the basic function called counterinsurgency. And that developed from the Special Forces, from the Green Berets and from that doctrine. And it was a move by the military to get into an area that the CIA had more or less made a pretty strong move into, especially in Laos and Vietnam. And the other side, the special activities part of SACSA, was simply to cover, just like saying, uh, and so forth, to cover anything else that was coming up. In these transfers, they very interestingly started with an army general, and uh, General Craig, who stayed only about a month or two in the job as chief of SACSA. And his problem was that being a straight-line Army general, he had difficulty making objective decisions regarding either CIA or, or Special Forces and the Air Force's Special Air Warfare Units and so on, whereas uh, a neutral general might have been able to make easier decisions. And this, because in that period of time they were very formative decisions, uh, they, they'd moved to another man. And the interim man after that was another Army general who had had a considerable experience with Special Forces, uh, and but was called for another job by the Army, so he stayed about two months. Finally, they brought in a Marine Major General, uh, Victor Krulak. Krulak was ideal. He had no biases with respect to that. He was straight Marine Corps, and as far as he was concerned, Special Forces, Special Air Warfare, the Navy SEAL teams, all of that, CIA's work and everything. He said, that's just an offshoot of the Marine Corps, so I know all about that stuff. And he was good. He was all right. What was new to him was the deception work and the Special Operations work. And we worked closely together for years, and it developed pretty well. The counterinsurgency role has been identified with Kennedy. I think the better way to read it would be that the counterinsurgency role was coming into the Defense Department from the CIA. It was either a matter of they get into it or the CIA was going to overwhelm them. And that it bloomed during the Kennedy period. A pretty good proof of that is that although the Special Forces Center at Fort Bragg is called the Kennedy Center, it actually was it had its inaugural uh, first class during the Eisenhower period. In fact, it was Mr. Douglas, Deputy Secretary of Defense, who went down there to inaugurate the school and the first classes, and I was down there, so I know the date for sure. Uh, and the Kennedy Center was not really the Kennedy Center. It was earlier than that, which shows that counterinsurgency and that kind of thing did not begin with Kennedy. It began before Kennedy. Right. You, you mentioned further on, the important thing to understand is that the much-heralded office of SACSA had very few military responsibilities. It was almost entirely CIA oriented. And this brings up this whole question of not only the importance to the secret team in general of an office like the Special Assistant for Counterinsurgency and Special Activities, but the besides General Krulak, there's this whole dovetailing of Maxwell Taylor coming back into the government after leaving in a huff, he resigned himself in 1958, 59, mm -hmm. and from the Eisenhowers, he was uh, the chairman of the Army, mm -hmm. and that chief point, of staff, chief of, staff right. of the Army, and left in a huff because of disagreements. Uh, Taylor wrote a book called The Uncertain Trumpet, which you uh, indicate you feel very strongly was uh, sort of fronting for this idea of flexible response but more directly, the, the whole linchpin of counterinsurgency as being this new form of operations that apparently, as you indicate, was more to increase the scope of CIA operations than to, in effect, do what it did, which was to change 
the military from a traditional military fighting stance to this sort of counterinsurgency focus or intent. Yes, you see, the, the shift from Eisenhower to Kennedy, first of all, as far as the bureaucracy was concerned, was most unexpected. They were all ready for Nixon. Just like, uh, as we see today, the Reagan-Bush uh, expectancy, well, there was, it was for sure. The bureaucracy was just ready for Bush to come in and keep things going. Well, we had the same feeling uh, in 1960. And those of us uh, at that time in the Pentagon could see that everything was moving toward a Nixon continuation of most of the Eisenhower program with some differences and with a strong bent toward CIA as Nixon had in those days. Well, that didn't happen and yet the infrastructure was all in place. The increase at Fort Bragg was in place. The Navy SEAL teams were already in place. I had opened up a big base for the CIA at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida and we had moved CIA aircraft down there in 1959, before a year before the election. We had uh, the air commandos created right next to Eglin at Hurlburt Air Force Base, and they were in being. These didn't; these were already in place, and there was wasn't anything the Kennedy administration could do to change that. Mm -hmm. Well, since they were in place, then there had to be some top echelon to govern or to direct their activities. And although SAXA was not a command situation, what SAXA did was provide the Joint Chiefs of Staff with the information necessary so they would understand the functional employment or they would be able to make use of the functional employment of these rather large organizations which were in being. With the arrival of Kennedy, the first thing that had to be out of the way was this Bay of Pigs operation. <clears throat> and we've discussed that. After the Bay of Pigs, he asked General Taylor to make a review of the Bay of, Pigs, Bay of Pigs and write him what he thought his administration should know about that kind of operation. The Taylor letter, and I must emphasize that every word of that letter had the approval of the other members of his group, meaning Alan Dulles, Admiral Burke, and Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy, most importantly. The, the Taylor letter really moved the Kennedy administration closer to, we'll, we'll call it, counterinsurgency to oversimplify. Because what Kennedy did, and this was, this was a, one of the most dominant things of the Kennedy era, of the Kennedy thousand days, was that he took the precise words of this Taylor report, this Taylor, Burke, Dulles, Kennedy report, and made them into a National Security Action Memorandum, which is a directive from the White House. It was NSAM number 55, and it was accompanied by two essential follow-on NSAM, 56 and 57, both of which, all three of which, contained the language of the Taylor letter. They were not new creations by somebody else. They were the language of the Taylor letter. And among other things, NSAM 55, directed that the chairman of the Joint Staff and the Joint Staff be the advisors to the President in peacetime as they would be in wartime. But most people who are not familiar with the full meaning of that don't realize that in time of war, the chairman of the Joint Staff is the number one advisor to the President, the Commander-in-Chief, not the Secretary of Defense, not the Secretary of State, nobody else, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that's the law. Well, when Kennedy said, you are my advisor in the peacetime, as you would be in wartime. He is saying to the chairman, you are my advisor for clandestine operations and all the other things being done in peacetime. He not only put that in words, <coughs> but the very technique he used to deliver it to the chairman was impressive. And I can't help but remember that because NSAM 55 was delivered in, to me in an envelope from the White House, and I was the one charged with the responsibility of briefing it to the chairman. Well, it arrived in my hands from the White House, and no notation on it whatsoever that a copy had gone to the State Department, to the Secretary of Defense, to the, to the Director of Central Intelligence. Nobody. And I never saw a paper like that from the, from the White House before. <coughs> it's just not protocol. It isn't what we do. 
But Kennedy wanted to emphasize by writing this letter directly to General Lemnitzer and saying, you are my advisor in peacetime as you would be in wartime. And let the other men find out the next day from copies, which of course we made immediately, that this is what the President had done. I can't overemphasize the shock that that procedure, not the words, that that procedure caused in Washington to the Secretary of State, to the Secretary of Defense, and particularly to the Director of Central Intelligence. Because Alan Dulles, who was still a director, had just lived through the shambles of the Bay of Pigs, had sat through all the hearings that were presided over by Maxwell Taylor uh, when they reviewed the Bay of Pigs, and now he finds out that what Kennedy does as a result of all this is say that you, General Lemnitzer, are to be my advisor. In other words, I'm not going to depend on Alan Dulles and the CIA. Uh, historians have glossed over that or don't know about it. That NSIM was more important in the Kennedy legacy than anything else except the assassination. It said more about Kennedy's plans for the government of the United States than anything else he assigned his name to at least until NSAM 263 in October 63. <coughs> this is where the Kennedy administration put their print on what they intended to do with clandestine operations. It didn't work exactly as he intended it because of some of the people involved. General Lemnitzer was not a cold warrior. And after I had briefed General Lemnitzer, he said, Proudy, put that in the file. We'll think about it. He was not about to put that up on a ben on a pennant and march around the city with it. He was not going to be the government's cold warrior. But he would if he was asked. He would, as he had always been. But he did not fit the role of the cold warrior. The next thing was that his replacement as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was Maxwell Taylor, the man that wrote this thing. So here was Maxwell Taylor writing NSAM 55, the president approving NSAM, putting his name on it and making it a White House directive, and then that directive sitting in the office with Maxwell Taylor now in the job that he intended to cre create for himself. Therefore, the, the Maxwell Taylor review of the Bay of Pigs problem became the Mein Kampf of the Maxwell Taylor era in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You see, just like the Jackson Korea Dulles report of 1949 being the Mein Kampf of the CIA. And anyone who studies Kennedy's role leading up to Vietnam and, and as far into Vietnam as he went before he died must keep in mind that he's the one that said the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was to be his advisor in Cold War. Now, of course, being an advisor in Cold War is not exactly the equal of being a commander in a Cold War, but it's pretty clearly. Uh, built on that idea. This was a major change, at least in the way things have been going during the Eisenhower Dulles era as we moved into the Kennedy and McCone era. McCone replaced uh, Alan Dulles within a few months. Uh, Bissell was released, General Cabell was released, and they started off with a new group of people in CIA. I, I cannot emphasize more how important NSAM 55 was in the Kennedy thousand days and also how important it is to realize that most people have omitted it completely in their studies of the Kennedy legacy. It gives a completely different view of Kennedy's objective. Several people have printed that Kennedy told Mansfield, among others, that he was going to break the agency in a thousand pieces. He had already broken it. You see, with NSAM 55, he had already told Alan Dulles, I don't need you as my advisor. See? That's pretty explicit. Mm -hmm. People need to think about that because that was important. And that's where the SAXA organization came in, ready-made with people who had a lot of experience. The, for instance, my Navy assistant uh, in, the, in my office had been one of the founders of the Navy SEAL team. And uh, the Army assistant, well, among others, was Al Haig and people like that. They were not just people brought in casually. They were experienced people. And without delay, the Army work at uh, Fort Bragg began to increase into the predominant number of Green Berets that we saw later in, uh, in uh, the Vietnam War. So we're dealing with a period here that was most interesting of much of this moving forward like a glacier with the Bay of Pigs to sort of sharpen Kennedy's attention 
and then his action right away to take over control, he, I'm not going to have another Bay of Pigs, you see, and he puts the JCS in charge of Cold War activity and removes the CIA from them. He already removed them. They're pretty important. Now, there's one problem, and Kennedy knew that, or found it out. Maxwell Taylor was not exactly his hip pocket Cold Warrior. Maxwell Taylor had prior understandings with CIA. And it was his own characteristic that he that he um, he wanted to be dominant in that field himself. You might almost say he visualized himself operating in somewhat the way Alan Mellis had. Or another way to put it was he was not your model military man at that time. Uh, in fact, uh, as, as a personal comment on that, a Limnitzer JCS meeting was a friendly, efficient, well-managed meeting with a thorough discussion of each subject. A Maxwell Taylor JCS meeting was quiet. Taylor delivered the subject and there was almost no discussion. He said, any more on that, gentlemen? No. Next subject. It was just like a, a meeting in a funeral parlor. It's, uh, it's hard to uh, understand exactly what that meant, but for those of us sitting in the second row and listening to the chiefs after we had spent so many years listening to them under Limitzer, you could see that Maxwell Taylor did not represent uh, the ideal or the representative military man at that time. So what Kennedy may have hoped to achieve uh, in this part of his time may not have been successful because of the individuals involved. Taylor was not the right man to do that. And you know he moved Taylor out of that job uh, not long after that and uh, made him ambassador to Vietnam, which is a kind of an unusual assignment for a man he never even knew before 1961. But this all gets pretty complex. But this era can't be studied enough if anyone wants to understand the Kennedy legacy. <clears throat> but Kennedy did not make uh, Taylor ambassador to Vietnam. Uh, Lodge was still his ambassador up to the time he was killed, right? It was not until 1964. Oh, Lodge, yes, you're right. Lodge, Lodge came in and Taylor went down in Vietnam after Lodge. You're, you're very correct. Is that, that's, that's right. <clears throat> the thing is that it was not Taylor who stayed on to fight the Vietnam War. It yes. was Wheeler, see. And had, had it worked the way Taylor, I think, wanted it to work, he would have stayed on all through the Vietnam War and become the military leader and he hoped victor of the Vietnam War because as chairman he would have Westmoreland and Abrams and all, all those people working for him and I think that's what he thought his role would be. But you're correct, Lodge came in there and then Taylor moved in. <clears throat> so your sense then of this, perhaps if he had retained the chairman's position of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and been able to in effect reside over a victory that he would have seen be affected through the use of counterinsurgency warfare tactics. Right, and you know, during the war he was a paratroop leader. Uh, in other words, he was more like the old army would say a cavalryman. He was a, a man ready to adapt new tactics and to fight new kinds of war. And uh, Taylor would have moved in that area. Mm -hmm. In an era of hydrogen bombs and uh, satellites and all that sort of thing, it may be that he was the last of a dying breed, just like the old horse cavalryman. <clears throat> this is right to the point in terms of uh, Taylor coming in. Uh, he was on this committee. You write about uh, Alan Dulles's role in the committee set up by Kennedy, uh, Dulles arranging for witnesses who would provide background briefings of the new agency drift into counterinsurgency. The broad plan for counterinsurgency as a marriage of the CIA and of the U.S. Army had been laid down during the months of the Eisenhower administration. It remained for its proponents, mostly men of the ST, to sell it to the Kennedy team. And then you write, throughout this complex process, his, Alan Dulles's, primary target for conversion to the CIA was General Maxwell Taylor. Here was the right man at the right time for Alan Dulles's exploitation and for use of the ST. And we've described then Taylor coming in and perhaps having his own ideas and uh, hopes or ambitions for how he could move up. And you had commented that Bobby Kennedy in the book, Bobby Kennedy had been very taken by this man, Taylor, and apparently in his talks each night, going back to talk to John Kennedy, must have uh, conveyed this sense of, of, the, of his fascination and interest in Taylor to John Kennedy, and then in effect somehow Kennedy 
doing just what, in the way you seem to write, Dulles would hope he would do, which would be to bring Taylor into the White House, to bring him in first as the special assistant to the president mm -hmm. for counterinsurgency. No, military. His military assistant. Military assistant. And then, in fact, <coughs> to be promoted to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yeah. That, you see, as was that, in effect, uh, by that point, the inertia, uh, Kennedy picked up on it and he somehow fell for it, that he... Not, not quite in that view. R remember, all the things we've talked about, about this transition period, which was an absolutely remarkable transition period. Uh, you remember Eisenhower had been there for eight years and we had followed World War II, so that it was a long period of uh, everything going in one direction. And then Kennedy was, uh, of course, uh, a much different focus in the government. Right. Now, what was accomplished here <clears throat> is by putting Dulles and Admiral Burke and General Taylor and Bobby Kennedy together in one room. <laughs> Whether Jack Kennedy knew what he had done or whether he lucked into it, I don't know. But it could not have been uh, a better group. I don't mean by that that they were homogenous. In fact, they were they were uh, opponents on almost every score. But this worked all right for Kennedy. His mind, and of course with Bobby there, could assimilate this, even though they were assimilating a lot of things they had no experience with. They didn't have this kind of military experience, especially Bobby didn't. And Jack's experience was limited to certain <clears throat> activities in World War II. But years and years of congressional experience, which I think people have discounted. People have forgotten that Jack Kennedy had been in Washington as a member of Congress, both, uh, both a representative and, and a senator, right up until his election. So he knew all of these things. But he was hearing them now by the experts. And by putting Alan Dulles on this committee, here's one of the things that happened. Dulles was the only man who could make up the witness list. So <laughs> I had worked with these people for years, and they were meeting, uh, the, the, the committee was meeting only about two doors down the hall from me in the JCS area, and a lot of these witnesses would come in and sit in my office and have a cup of coffee until they were called into the room. There's a little narrow hallways down there. There's no windows outside. I don't know if you've ever been in the JCS area, but it's the pits. <laughs> and you might think it's the finest area in Washington, but it isn't. Well, I began to notice the ones they were calling in there. And some of them had not worked on the Bay of Pigs. They were old-time Dulles implants from years back who might have had some peripheral job with the Bay of Pigs, but not basically. What they were doing, what, what the agency was doing, what Alan Dulles was doing, was using this opportunity of sitting there every day with Bobby Kennedy and every day with Maxwell Taylor to do some indoctrination. Mm -hmm. And it was heavy. As you, If you read some of this report, you'll see that that indoctrination went all the way back to his old uh, Jackson, Korea, Dulles mm -hmm. philosophy. He was planting it back in there. Well, he had a very willing hand in Maxwell Taylor. Taylor had gotten out of the government in a huff. Coming back in, he had a lot of retreading to do, had to make himself important there. And with this new group, the Kennedy group, is a chance to move in. And he really did. Yeah. And he got intimate, friendly with Bobby Kennedy. In fact, as you know, Bobby, one of Bobby's children is called Maxwell Taylor Kennedy. Yeah. Bobby was really influenced by Taylor. Yeah. And uh, Dulles was influencing Taylor from his side. And Ali Burke is a rather stoic individual who I'm quite sure did not join too much in the conversation, but probably just saw the sense of humor on the whole thing and just sat there. I know Ali Burke quite well. He's the finest CNO the Navy has ever had and a very competent person in his own right. But he had no axe to grind in this committee. Well, as this thing progressed, it went longer than we ever expected because more people went in there, uh, ushered in by Alan Dulles, because he saw that he was becoming effective in this business of indoctrinating yeah. Bobby Kennedy and Maxwell Taylor into the views of Alan Dulles and the CIA. So you see a little of that mixed up. But quite frankly, my own view, and I believe I inherit some of this from my boss, General Krulak, was that... <clears throat> was that Bobby Kennedy saw both sides of this. He was not a neophyte either. And he, he kind of went along with some of this um, uh, listening to everything that Alan Dulles said 
But at the same time, I think the Kennedys had decided that Alan Olaf was through, and I think they had also decided that Taylor was a strong man, that they would stay with him, and he would be, you know, in their control. He would not be out of control, as Dulles might have been. So they were perfectly willing to let this go together. <clears throat> and, you know, historians will tell you, many of them, that there was no report as a result of this work. As a matter of fact, I myself researched for it. I tried to get it in my files. I mean, I had legitimate government files in those days, and I couldn't get it. I had NSAM 55, but I never realized that NSAM 55 was the report, verbatim. I had it as a presidential directive, and I had to read it to General Lemnitzer as a presidential directive. I didn't know that it was verbatim, almost verbatim, the words of Maxwell Taylor. Okay. The uh, secrecy surrounding that report and other things to do with the Bay of Pigs uh, was remarkable. And I won't address the Bay of Pigs problems right here. I'll stay with the, this uh, NSAM 55 and the Taylor report. Uh, even those of us working intimately, I know when I, when I talked to the chiefs of staff, they asked me if I had any idea who had written NSAM 55 uh, for the president. The president write all his papers. Did uh, McGeorge Bundy write it? Did, did Sorensen write it, his, uh, his advisor, special legal advisor, his general counsel? <clears throat> or, or who wrote it? They were trying to find out who wrote this very powerful paper. And we, we of course, thought that it was an individual paper, NSAM 55. We didn't realize that it was simply extracted practically verbatim out of the, the Taylor Dulles report. Years later, <clears throat> Someone was researching some files in the Kennedy Library area and came across a box of letters from the Kennedy era that had been assembled by the GSA, you know, the housekeeping department of the government. They were relatively nondescript. Some were stamped classified and all, but because of the years that passed, that didn't bother them. And a researcher connected with Harvard University sent me a copy of this Taylor letter and said, could I help them identify the letter and its significance? As I read the first paragraphs, I realized that this Taylor letter to the president was NSAM 55, or I recognized that this letter to the president was actually the report of the board. Well, <laughs> in the intervening time, I had had lunch with Admiral Burke in Washington one day, and I asked him, I said, you know, Admiral, I was just down the hall from the hearings while you were running this review of the Bay of Pigs effort with, with uh, Bobby Kennedy and Alan Dulles and Max. I said, you know, I have a hard time believing that there was no report as a result of your meetings all through that time. You had to make a report to President Kennedy. And we're good friends. And he looked at me and he smiled. And he said, you know, Prouty, we didn't need to write a report to the president. He says, that little son of a bitch Bobby was there all the time. <laughs> and he really made his point because, after all, if Bobby Kennedy's in the room, what do you have to tell Jack Kennedy, see? So I believed him. And years later, when I found this report that had been found in the bales of records that the GSA had assembled and had been not identified otherwise, here I found the same words. What they did is Arleigh Burke didn't lie to me about the report. He just didn't tell me that it wasn't a report. It was a letter. letter. Well, it, it, we need to dwell on it because it was so important in the Kennedy era and in the Kennedy legacy. And it explained the role of, of the Kennedys, but it explained the role of Maxwell Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, and it explained how they intended to move into this area of the Cold War without an Allen Dulles and without the CIA in its unlawful role. Remember, we've said there was no law, no law that said the CIA should be in covert operations. Now, I don't need to make too much more of that, but the NSAM 56 and the NSAM 57 that accompanied this, but were distributed to the Secretary of Defense and the DCI and all the rest, were properly distributed, were very powerful documents also. So it wasn't just the one document that came down. It was a whole family of documents. They were all familiar to Taylor. They moved Taylor into being the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I thoroughly believe, and of course this took a while, the arguments over these things, the policy developments over 
how this would be done, carried on well in through the years 1962. And by 1963, when you might have expected these things to become um, operative, the president was killed. Right. And of course, in the Johnson administration, no one ever mentioned these things anymore. Mm -hmm. So there was so much security over these things and so much more publicity about the Bay of Pigs itself that few people have bothered to go back and look at these very dominant uh, papers that reveal the intention of the Kennedy uh, administration and it certainly would have gone in effect in a second uh, four-year term. Mm -hmm. <coughs> There's a couple of <coughs> spin-offs of this that have me very uh, wondering where you, uh, what you meant or, or the significance. One is you write uh, about this uh, post-mortem set of hearings. Uh, in terms of that, Alan Dulles knew that JFK and RFK had learned a lot from the Bay of Pigs and he now knew where the Kennedy's Achilles tendon was, and he had hold of that vital spot. What did, what did you mean by that vital spot? What were you speaking well, about? Well, let me explain something that is a rather practical matter here. <clears throat> I wrote my book in um, 1970. 71. I revised it in 71 after the release of the Pentagon Papers because I then had access to all of the Pentagon Papers material. I did not have this original Taylor report at those days. Yeah. So I cannot use my knowledge today to tell you why I wrote as I did then and keep the story in line. In those days, it was clear that the Kennedys were making this change, but we didn't have the evidence that showed that it was Maxwell Taylor himself who had done this. Yes. You see? Had we known that, if I had known that when I briefed uh, General Lemnitzer, you can imagine how explosive that would have been done. If I said, look, this is what Maxwell Taylor told Kennedy, and here's what we're going to do, you know, that would have been <laughs> would have been a hard thing to tell General Lemnitzer. Because General Lemnitzer and Maxwell Taylor were not exactly the, I think it was General Lemnitzer who followed Taylor as, uh, as the chief of staff of the army. I'm not real sure how that, but I think that's what it was. And it wasn't that they weren't friends, it's just that they had great differences in their personality and in their methods of operation within the military. Yeah. Well, you cannot go back through the years and change things yes. that are dyed in wool because <laughs> I wrote the book based on that information and I learned some of these things later. Okay. Uh, more to the point than here, perhaps, you say also regarding Lemnitzer when he left the JCS, he said, then President Kennedy made a most significant move, one perhaps that has had more impact upon events during the past 10 years than any other that can be attributed to him or his successors. He decided to transfer General Lemnitzer to Paris. Uh, why, what do you think his rationale was for that? Well, Lemnitzer was the preeminent uh, commander at that time, uh, at least based on seniority and rank. and. Kennedy always Europe oriented, you know, always Europe oriented. His father had been ambassador to the court of St. James, wanted the strongest and best man on duty to take over the post that Eisenhower had held in, uh, in Europe, and Lemnitzer certainly was qualified. I think that was a, was a good assignment. Uh, Lemnitzer, by that time, was not going to be the man to run the Vietnam War, we'll say. I don't think that that was preeminent in, uh, in Kennedy's plans either. I don't think Kennedy had any idea that he'd have to have a strong military commander to run the Vietnam War. That's all hindsight if anybody sees it that way. Yeah. He wanted the best man in Europe that he could get, and Lemnitzer was the best man. Okay. Uh, and what another point in the book you write, from 1954 through 1963, all American activity in Vietnam was dominated by the CIA. Although Lansdale and his key men, such as Charles Bohannon, Bohannon? Bohannon. Bohannon Lucien Conan, Conin, Conin, the U.S. go-between at the time of the DM coup d'etat, Bill Rawson, Arthur Arundel, I don't know how to pronounce these, mm -hmm. Rufus Phillips, and others were listed in the Pentagon Papers with military rank. They were all in the employ of the CIA and were operating as CIA agents. Uh, I'd be curious if you had... Uh, knowledge in any of these cases. What did each of these key men of Lansdale do? What were their particular areas of expertise? Well, as uh, we now know, there, there is a new book out 
on Lansdale's life, <clears throat> his biography, uh, that explains a lot of this, but it does need other explanation. Many of these men had worked with Lansdale when he was in the Philippines and when he had been given the authority to work uh, within the Philippines in a covert activity designed to overthrow the president of the Philippines, Quirino, and in his place put a new president and it turned out to be Ramon Magsaysay. Lansdale's assistant then was Bo Bohannon and uh, uh, Valeriano, a, a Filipino. Um, Conin was in Vietnam at the time. I don't think Conin worked in the Philippines. I used to work in the Philippines at the time and met many of these people that were involved. Uh, when, Lansdale's, when Lansdale was assigned to Vietnam as chief of the Saigon military mission, then he pulled together many of his Philippine team including Filipinos as well as Americans, and he brought into it uh, Arthur Arundel, Rufus Phillips, and many others who were uh, what we call psychological warfare technicians and other specialists for the role that Arundelas had assigned the Saigon military mission in Vietnam. We must remember that although it was known as the Saigon military mission, it was not a military mission, and most of its work was not done in Saigon. It was simply a cover arrangement that the agency had created in early 1954 as they prepared for the development of South Vietnam as an independent nation and for the introduction of Diem, No Din Diem, as president of Vietnam. This job was, was assigned to Lansdale very much as he had been assigned the job of producing Mag Sai Sai as president of the Philippines. <coughs> um. <coughs> Do you think that Kennedy, or did Kennedy think that all these men were affiliated with the DOD instead of the CIA, or, or did you have any sense of that? Well, I think that we'll have to watch the years here. Uh, the years you're talking about, the 50s, uh, Kennedy had nothing to do with it. Uh, later, the mission was still there, but as uh, after the Geneva Agreement, the introduction of Diem and the sort of escalation of our activities in Vietnam, the role of the Saigon military mission was blended into all the other things that were going on in Vietnam so that it was not as dominant as it was in the 50s. And during the Kennedy era, uh, the you must remember, um, during that era, Lansdale was back in the Pentagon and uh, so on. And when things were changed greatly in the Kennedy years. Okay. So it was not a contiguous yeah. or continuum That's right. of events. Uh, there's a great deal to discuss in all of this. I'd like to get into uh, a couple of last key areas as I see them. One is the uh, military assistance program. I'm going to quote briefly from something in the latter part of the book where you were describing a special presidential committee which had been formed early in 1959 to study training under the mutual security program and to provide instruction to recipient countries in concepts or doctrine governing the employment of the military instrument in peace and in war. This committee was laying it right on the line that the government should be stepping into the mutual security program with military training, including the development of paramilitary capability in the recipient nations. The only way this could be carried out would be to mount clandestine operations in every country where this was to apply. By this period, the CIA knew that it was ready, equipped, and in a position to do this in any counterinsurgency list country, as it had been digging its way firmly into the MAP since the MAP or military assistance program since the earliest days of the Greek and Turkish aid campaigns. Uh, could you briefly just discuss the creation and background of the military assistance program and how, over time, uh, through CIA agents uh, working within it and the agenda of overall uh, well, attempted control by the agency of its reach and scope. Recipient countries found themselves hostages to their own armies because of the domination of the ST agenda of combining the focus of political, social, and economic uh, directives all under a vast authority of our military which set up these countries' own military-based governments. That's sort of a convoluted question. Well, in order to unravel all that, which is an enormous story, and it is very important, 
I, first of all, have to <clears throat> say that I printed the document that you're talking about from the White House. It was a White House document, a very long one, as an appendix to my book. And anyone seriously interested in that most important thing should turn to that because I can't go through 20 or 30 pages here and all of the things that it meant in detail. There, after World War II, there were a number of people in our government uh, who believed that the way to stabilize any other country, especially those in the Third World, was through the strengthening of their army. And then they saw the army as being sort of a modifying influence in the government so that no matter who was running the country, they'd more or less do what the army said. See, well, that, that's, a, that's quite a concept because it doesn't work that way, of course. The army puts up a dictator and then they run the country themselves. But this was the idea. Yeah. And you might say it was the idea that Lansdale had when he brought Mag Saisai to the top in the Philippines. Because in doing that, what he and his agency supporters planned to do was to create an element within the Philippine army that would sustain Mag Saisai through several terms in office, uh, hopefully using elections from one to the other, but using the army to make sure the elections went right. You see, it's, a, it's hard to describe it, but this is the way they were working. They were saying, look, if you create an army that is very stable, has no great ambitions, they're just keeping the country going, They'll take care of this sort of as a force in the middle, or what I found out later, they were all reading Mao Zedong's Little Red Book. They all believed that the army was a fish living in the water, and the water were the people. Mm -hmm. Well, that might work for Mao Zedong, but I'm not so sure it's going to work in Nicaragua or in Greece. Yeah. But they were writing this kind of document. The two authors of that paper you're referring to, one was General Stilwell and the other was General Lansdale had become greatly enamored of the Little Red Book. I know when I worked with Lansdale, year in and year out in the same office, I'd hear him quote that darn thing. He could quote it no matter what situation we're talking about. He'd have some quotation from the Little Red Book. So you have to get into that context. But the other side of it was, you see, this had much to do with the CIA's philosophy that you react to events. Yes. Have your military out there in all these countries as military assistance program people. And then they're the eyes and ears in that country to see if things are going the way you want them to go, yeah. you see? So that's what they really meant, that the military assistance program is kind of a, a sensor, kind of an intelligence organization telling you that things are all right in Greece and things are going fine in Peru, yeah. or alerting you if, like they did in Indonesia. That's how they found out that they thought it was time for a rebellion in Indonesia, because the military assistance people told them so. Of course, it failed miserably. but. We can't go through this in a few minutes, sure. but it is extremely important and it is central to the philosophy of that era as applied by CIA and by CIA's uh, close associates and allies, not only within the U.S. military, but in other military allied with them around the country, like the British, the Australians, the Canadians, and so on. It was part of the Cold War mechanism. Yeah. Um, Obviously, it hasn't worked because <clears throat> the reaction government is hard to run through another agent, see? Sure. But it's what we've tried to make work, and that's why we've seen sometimes what we thought were loyal governments overthrown, even though they were anti-communist, Trujillo, for example. And, uh, I mean, if you, if you want to have anti-communism uh, in power, you couldn't get a better anti-communist than Trujillo, and yet we removed him, you see? It was part of the same thing as a very uh, impersonal type approach and probably an imperfect type approach. Yes. But I simply quoted, or I simply printed as it was written, uh, this, this doctrine as presented by General Stilwell and General Lansdale, mm -hmm. and as approved by the White House, at least in those days, back in about 1960 or 61, I believe. I forget the date of the document. I think, I think it's 58 yeah. or 59, but it's right okay. in yeah. late Eisenhower's <clears throat> second term. Yes, it was an Eisenhower period. I, I'm sure the Kennedy people did not endorse it yeah. in a later time. <clears throat> the, one more follow-up on that. Uh, you're writing at about the same point in the book, page 394. Under the cover of the Bay of Pigs operation, much bigger moves were being made. All over the world, the MAP training program was picking up volume and momentum. Thousands of foreigners <clears throat> from all foreign 40 countries that we were trying to establish this in converged upon the United States for training and indoctrination.
established this in, converged upon the United States for training and indoctrination. The new curriculum was either the one at Fort Bragg or like it. The Army interest in political, social, economic programs under the general concept of nation building was gaining momentum. For every class of foreigners who were trained and indoctrinated with these ideas, there were American instructors and American soldiers who were being brainwashed by the very fact that they were being trained to teach this new doctrine. To them, this non-military, political, social, and economic theme was the true doctrine of the U.S. Army. A whole generation of the American Army has grown up with this and now believes to one degree or another that the natural role of an army lies in this political field. They believe the army is the chosen instrument in nation building, whether the subject be political, social, economic, or military. In many cases, due to the great emphasis the CIA placed on training the police forces of certain foreign countries, a large number of American servicemen who were used for such training became active in what was really police work and not the scope of regular military work. Uh, that's just, to me, it is, it is so fundamental, this idea of what we saw so much in the 60s and 70s, where we sensed as a nation, some of us at least, that these police re agencies in other countries that were being so repressive were somehow operating under our tutelage. And well, in fact, <coughs> the best model is Iran. <coughs> you see, <coughs> under this philosophy, we moved into Iran after 1949 <coughs> in, uh, in large numbers. The agency was involved all over in Iran, everywhere, where the agency founded the Iranian airline and, and many other things like that. The, the military had all kinds of radar detection devices up there for scanning into the Soviet Union, but also this provided the backbone of a lot of activity in Iran. But it led to <coughs> programs where we actually imported thousands of Iranian young men selected to be leaders in Iran then and for future years and they went to uh, technical schools in the United States, they went to Fort Bragg, they went to all kinds of schools, and, and they were actually given very, very useful training from their point of view, and then were put back into Iran. And by the later years of this program, you know, into the mid-70s and so on, the CIA had uh, enormous dossiers of people in Iran they knew every person who would be of use in any area, electronics or academically or medical and so on, because we had brought them over here for some kind of training. Iran was probably the test bed for this to its extreme. And of course the Shah was uh, right in the middle of it. You know, as I wrote in a book, I think one of the, or I wrote in, a, in another article, one of the most uh, important assignments made by Nixon when he was president was Richard Helms, the, the former director of Central Intelligence, as ambassador to Iran. We, we completely, uh, you might say, converted Iran into this type of dream, which is an offshoot of the little red book of Mao Zedong. Mm. And um, as a result, we got what we planted. You know, we, we sowed the seeds and we got it. Now, the people in Iran who are in power have access to the same people that we've trained here they know more about us than we do about them. This is something people don't realize about the uh, more or less problems we're having today. They wonder how the Iranians can do this and how the Iranians can do that. Well, behind the screen of this man Khomeini, all these thousands of Iranians that we've trained are totally familiar with our system, just like Noriaga and Panama. Just because there was a coup d'etat doesn't mean these people forget the things we trained them to do. And now we're paying the price by having well-trained individuals in many of these countries that uh, in a sense have turned that training against us or at least have said, look, we understand you better than you think we do. Now lay off us, see? and like Noriaga is saying. So, and, and even to a degree, what's happening in Nicaragua is an outgrowth of this. Mm -hmm. Because if you teach the people that the army is the chosen instrument to control the country, and, and then they do that, and the army does take over, they think that's what we were telling them to do, you see? It's, it's a very interesting thing, and uh, we need to think about it very much because it has shaped what we've been doing in many countries. The thing is, if you look very carefully at what the men that started this movement were writing and doing, and I mean by that the White House report written by Stilwell and Lansdale, then you'll begin to get a perspective of what has happened since those years and why it happened. 
uh, I think most of us would not really expect the army to be the leavening inst instrument in any political scramble, like in, in Chile, for example. Uh, Allende is elected by the people, and then he's killed by Pinochet. Which one would we, should we really, as Americans, be supporting? Well, Pinochet is a man we trained. Allende, we, we say, my goodness, he's a, he's a communist, he's a socialist, so on. So we reap what we sowed when we get that sort of thing. And I think that's really what I'm trying to say in the book, that this is the way things were going in that era. I think this also <clears throat> shows you that when the Kennedy administration began to realize some of the things that uh, were going on, how they had been going on, they began to make major changes. They began to stop some of these things. And I think that it's that kind of pressure, that universal pressure, not any given point, but that universal pressure against the system that was heavily implanted that led to Kennedy's death. That it, it would seem so. Um, I'm just trying to catch a few last things in the remaining 20 minutes we have. One is, in terms of Kennedy, you right? Kennedy knew that he had been badly burned by the Bay of Pigs incident. And by June of 1961, with these NSAMs 55 through 57, he and Bobby knew that he had been let down by the ST, or secret team. And in parentheses you say, I carefully switched to the ST label here, because in all fairness to the CIA, it was more than the CIA that really created the unfortunate operation. I was wondering if you could give some sort of summation of how the ST is, in your sense or eyes, larger than the CIA and what other groups, if such can be named, it compromise, it comprises? Well, if you analyze the Bay of Pigs operation very carefully, you'll see that its components uh, were far beyond any capability of the agency unless they had the very willing and active support of the, of the rest of the government. And the rest of the government in a secret team mode. You see, not a regularly established air arm of the Air Force, not a regular established sea arm of the Navy with the Navy logistics. In it. For instance, at the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Navy logistics behind all that was enormous. People didn't realize it, but it took place. Well, the same thing with the Bay of Pigs. Yeah. And the Navy was there. They weren't called upon. They shouldn't have been called upon, but they were there. Even the State Department involved in the political side of this thing. Who would follow Castro? Who would be the chosen people to follow Castro? And there were large financial expenditures and such a thing. These things don't take place within the CIA alone. And it's important to see the CIA that way. The CIA is always merged with the rest of the government that's taking part in these actions. Yes. Well, because this was true over such a long period of time, there were people who were very familiar, well-trained with this kind of thing, and every time a covert activity came up, they were involved again. Well, this is the secret team. They can carry these out, and now with the Iran-Contra exposure, you can see that the secret team even bred the enterprise, people who were making money off this deal. It went beyond even getting the job done. They were doing it so good they had money to spare, see? And that's exactly what I was talking about. It's almost as though we ran the... Bay of Pigs operation as a commercial venture, uh, hoping that when they took over Cuba, uh, some of the leaders would gain the casino rights and everything else back into Cuba. As a matter of fact, I, I think I said something there that's ahead of myself. A broker called me from Washington a few days before the Bay of Pigs was planned to go and said, Colonel Prouty, he just happened to know me. He didn't know my job. And he said, Colonel, can you give me any explanation why all of a sudden people from the Pentagon are calling me buying sugar stock. Sugar stock had dropped to pennies because Castro had boycotted the, the American sugar down there and the companies had lost a lot of money. But all of a sudden, people who knew about the, pro the prospect of the invade were buying sugar stock, $10,000, $20,000 at a time, and the sugar stock demand was going up before the Bay of Pigs. So they were running it as a commercial venture. You know, there were some more enterprises then. And it's inevitable. You know, you're dealing with these things, you, you do that. So you can't say that the Bay of Pigs was 100% a CIA operation. Yeah. The government becomes involved in these things. Okay. Any more than you could say the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War from 45 to 65 was very much under the operational control of CIA. From 65 on, the CIA was still there more than ever, 
but the military moved in and the military took over. It became too big for the CIA. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I, this, I, if you can, try to discuss to me this uh, crippling and devastating contradiction that covert operations have to be deniable because the commander-in-chief must otherwise, if they are undeniable, accept responsibility for involvement, quote, in an illegal and traditionally unpardonable activity. We were operating from 1954 under an NSC directive that required that any and every covert operation leave room for the government, U.S. government, to disclaim plausibly its role, that it was not involved. Take the U-2 that went down in the Soviet Union. If you'd had a chance to study that plane, you'd find that every single instrument in the plane, the cloth and the fabric of the pilot's clothing, the tires, everything, had no names whatsoever. It didn't say Goodyear tires or something like that, you know. Uh, everything in it, those were scrubbed clean in order to retain deniability. We could say we had nothing to do with it. Well, of course, the Bay the U-2 uh, going down was a uh, very faulty operation, but I cite that. Aircraft that I operated, for instance, in aerial overflights to supply the rebels fighting for the lives of their country in Tibet, every marker on those airplanes had been changed, every or cleaned off, scrubbed off, sanitized. We call them sanitized air. It cost us millions of dollars to sanitize these aircraft because we had to deny, if the plane went down, we had to deny we had anything to do with it. Uh, th this is, in a sense, ridiculous because you can't do it. Oh, the type of planes we use were made in the United States and so on. No one uh, else but, could build a plane Well, like that. but a lot of people used them. See, we okay. used 130 aircraft. They were used all over the world. It, it, it was effective in those things, but if you did get caught they could quickly analyze who would be doing this, and it comes down to the United States or <laughs> one or two others at the most. But that aspect of the deniability was required by NSC directive, and we spent millions of dollars trying to carry it out. However, once the operation gets above the bonfire fire stage, you can't hide it. You see, we used to know that when they tell us we're going to Indonesia with a covert operation, and right away they asked me for 42,000 rifles. I mean, that's not a covert. You see, you can't, you can't deny that 42,000 American-made rifles show up in Indonesia. We had nothing to do with it. So there's a bit of a hypocrisy in that prospect. But in the early Eisenhower era, when that was written, they never intended operations to become large enough to be out of hand. Even the Bay of Pigs, as I have stressed earlier, was intended to be small aerial drops over the beach things, never an invasion. The invasion idea started after the Kennedy election in November of, uh, of 60. Mm -hmm. So I find nothing wrong with these statements about the fact that the government attempted to keep these things really covert. But uh, in fact, we haven't addressed NSAM 57, but 57 yeah. speaks of uh, covert activities up to a certain point may be assigned to CIA, up to a certain size, may be assigned, and after that size, they may be assigned to the military. Well, they began to recognize in that era that there's only certain small things that should be assigned to CIA. After that, it's a military point. You might just as well hoist the flag and say, Americans are coming. You, you can't deny it. You can't hide it. And if you have to put up with this kind of action, which is a denial of the national sovereignty of your target country, no matter who it is, whether it's Iran or whether it's Peru or whether it's Indonesia, what you're really doing is denying the sovereignty of another nation. And that's criminal among the family of nations. So there's important considerations here, but in covert activities, you live with that. But given that it's such a paradox, paradoxical uh, statement of our times, given that they are illegal, that they do violate whatever nation's sovereignty that we uh, move within without their approval, and then that there have been these incidents where the true nature of it, to some degree at least, has become known and they become compromised and you can't deny them. The most blatant one recently is when Neil's, uh, the, uh, whatever his first name was, got north to admit that basically everyone except the American people knew what North knew about these things, and the only persons that North was concealing it was from was from the American public. No one else. 
and, and the, the, the poverty of that type of admission and how damaging it was, but there's never any analysis of the real impact or implications for what that means. The way we withdrew from the world court would be an example mm -hmm. of just, well, we'll solve the problem by just withdrawing from a court that rules against us, that says that we committed an illegal act when we covertly bombed the uh, harbors of Nicaragua. Uh, how much longer do you feel we can go on uh, with this kind of illegality? Well, <clears throat> let's be blunt about it. I have read in other books, and uh, I only say that to soften the blow, <laughs> and I believe thoroughly that there is no longer anything called sovereignty. It doesn't exist. Yeah. We are kidding ourselves if we think uh, sovereignty exists any longer. If we want to just consider the fact that Soviet satellites circle over our country every half hour, obtain almost any information they want. If you go into the world of finance, and the world of communications, and the world of transportation, the whole global aspect, Walter Riston himself, Mr. U.S. Banker, has written a book called Risk and other four-letter words in which he says categorically that we live in a one-world financial communications uh, sphere and that there is no such thing as national sovereignty. I think we need to think about that and believe it and we reside in that community now, it's the way things are. Uh, the idea that there's such things as covert operations is kind of an old time uh, deal. It's like going back to horse and buggy. Uh, I think people that want to dwell on the fact that sovereignty ought to exist because it's a blessed event, well, that's gone. And I, I feel sorry for them. I've had a lot of people argue bitterly with me over that point, but how are you going to deny it? How's Walter Biston going to deny it? So. What we're really doing is we are, I read only recently something that I have written about and believe that we no longer are going to be able to resort to warfare. Now, nations are built on warfare. Nations retain their ability to control their people on the basis of the fact that they have an enemy somewhere and they must prepare for war. Now, that's traditional. That goes way back, but that's ended. And in place of that, covert operations is one side of it, but not a very good one. The other side is the enormous power of the economy today. And here, the United States, at least up to now, has had the advantage in economic power, just like we used to have the advantage in nuclear power. Uh, I think that this will be where the major struggles are fought, and I think that's why there's a realignment now coming about, because it serves no purpose for nations to sit each on one side of the world and the other with hydrogen bombs and from their nose at each other. We both know that given, uh, barring a mistake, an uh, absolute stupid mistake, there's no point in launching hydrogen bombs. Yeah. So a lot of the things that the government wrote in the 50s and the, took place in the Kennedy era in the 60s or that I wrote in the 70s and so on are really caught up by time. We live in the 80s and we're getting into the 90s. And the warfare from here on out is going to be economic. And it bothers me considerably to find that for the last decade we have had a president who reduced our economic position to an all terrible de deficit and handed over to his successor a checkbook with an overdrawn account. This means the United States is not going to be able to write any checks or to carry out initiatives because we're broke. And in the days when you're going to run an economic war, the worst thing that could happen is to be broke. Uh -huh. And these are the things we need to think about today. And I just as soon give up the whole idea of the secret team because I don't think we're going to be calling on that kind of an operation any longer. I think the shambles of the Iran thing and the Contra thing is, is the end of it. I think it's wrapped up that kind of work. It doesn't accomplish anything. And the secrecy surrounding it does just what you said. We kept the secret from the American people. The rest of the world were laughing at us. But this is, will be overwhelmed by our present situation in the economic world where we are broke. And if we don't do something about that, uh, we're going to have many more serious problems than we've had looking down the guns at nuclear weapons and so on. I guess it's just a last question then as far as this, the looking at the momentum or the uh, inertia of something like the secret team as far as the support of the defense industry, that which Eisenhower warned, which he had learned about so painfully when his crusade for peace had been shattered by powers going down right before he went to see Khrushchev. Uh, 
just as a, I guess, challenging you here to uh, give a sense of how this might come about, it seems like the inertia is still there so much. How do you get people who have for years profited and gained so much by the kind of uh, uh, defense, military, iron triangle uh, system to get them to break that? You wrote, uh, with regard to the creation of the U-2 plane by Lockheed, largely through the doggedness of Vice President Kelly Johnson, successfully selling the idea for this product to the Air Force. Uh, what about th the fact that this was a classic example of how a project that should have been military because it was too large to be clandestine became covert simply as an expedient and that the reasoning was that in peacetime it could not be military because it was clandestine, so it was to be directed by the CIA, the typical secret team tautology. I think that's a good way to put it, but I think that's one of the things that I am saying is behind us. I see. Uh, because, uh, for instance, look at the problems the government is having attempting to introduce the B-1 and B-2 bombers mm -hmm. into some reasonable strategy. There's no role for them. There's yeah. nothing to do with them. Yeah. And the fact that they're so-called stealthy, or at least the B-2 is supposed to be stealthy, that only means stealthy in an environment of radar. It makes more noise than, than, than old bombers used to. We used to hear our old bombers before the radar was developed. You see, a lot of these things are developed to sell the product. Right. So the idea of going back to that world is, is behind us. And I don't, I don't think it's going to stop. Yeah. What we're going to do is move into the energy and food eras and we will spend as much time dominating the production of energy and the selling of energy products and food production as we used to spend on B-2 bombers and the things like that. The government doesn't stand still and it's, we're not going to be defeated by anybody, but the weapons are going to be different. Yeah. There's more talk today about Malthusianism. There's more talk today about biological warfare. And I think there's more talk today about mind control. Uh, these are weapons again, but it's a different kind of war. So we can say that all of these things that were written in the 50s and the 60s certainly existed, but I don't see them replicated in the 90s and after the year 2000. But I think the big war will be over the energy supplies and over food supplies. And uh, of course, energy supplies, that war started in 1973. The Arab oil embargo w was given the same treatment that uh, covert operations were. The only people that didn't know what was really going on in the Persian Gulf were the American people. We were just paying for it at the gas tank, but we didn't know why. Yeah. Well, these are very critical things, but that's going to be the future of this business. Yeah. Well, that's a good close-off on the secret team. Thank you. <laughs>